On the instruction of Gurudev and by his mercy, we continue our reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, Chapter 4, by Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, in the translation and with the commentary by Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Let me know if sound is okay, or if it's not okay, maybe it's better. We go it's slowly. Very good. Uh, thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. We'll go slowly today and remember to start uh, why, we're, <laughs> why we're doing this. Um, why the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is important for us, and why we begin hopping into the middle of the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the early middle, but nonetheless the middle, at the point where he's describing the confidential reasons for his appearance, the personal reasons, the internal reasons, the ones related to his own soul, the ones related to his own spiritual existence. Why are these so important for us in our, in our practice? And how can we find inspiration by, by understanding these reasons? There are many religions. There are many gods to choose among, many gods and demigods to venerate or to respect or to, to worship. That's not the issue for us. The issue is the relation we have to our God or gods, or in our case, our Ishtadev. When we focus on the external nature of the God, when we focus on the God with reverence and fear, with pure respect, then the God becomes a thing for us. It becomes a, a, an empty object for our material senses. Something, something we can view only from the outside. Something we can view with our minds, with our intellects. Something we can only understand from a distance. Something that can be admired, surely, but admired from a distance, from the outside. Something that can be enjoyed or touched or smelled, but always in intellectual ways, in material or, or subtle ways. So respect and veneration, and worship of traditional gods happens externally based on external qualities. What's completely different in the Gaudiya tradition, by the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, is that divinity becomes an internal relation. And by internal relation, I say the same thing twice. It's a relation because it's a relation to what's in the heart of God. A, re a relation to God's soul, a relation to God's personality. And it's a relation that's very close because our own soul as Atma is part and parcel of the Paramatma, the super soul, which is God. So the very first idea in bhakti, the practice of bhakti in the Gaudiya tradition is that true spirituality is relation. A relation from heart to heart. And, <coughs> excuse me. and that's why we're so interested in this chapter four, because it's about the internal nature of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
the internal thoughts and feelings. It's about the soul that we that wants to have a relation with our soul. About the feelings that want to have a relation with our feelings. And on its highest level, as we remember, um, that uh, those feelings are feelings of love. The highest form of feeling is love, and the highest form of love is love of God or pain. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embodies exactly this idea, this aspiration, that spirituality is relation. Bhakti is the expression, or maybe let's say something like the reality of Krishna's desire to have relation with his devotees. And why relation with devotees? Because he wants to understand what it is to have relation with God himself. And this is why, as we know, he takes the position of his beloved Radha, her mood, her, her point of view, in order to have a relation with God. As a model, for the kind of relation that he wants to have with us. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, and it's maybe a way of summarizing the verses we've read so far. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, well, I don't want to be a beautiful, intelligent, rich, splendid, external God one that you can admire at a distance. I want to be the God who knows how to love and therefore can feel the highest love. I want to know the highest love, the love of God, and therefore I take the position of the lover of God. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the incarnation of God as lover, Radha, and God as beloved Mohan. And this is then why he took birth, as you know, in, Nav in uh, Navadvip, at the end of the 15th century. I said it before, but it's worth repeating a very modern appearance. So 15th century in Europe, this is about the time when we were inventing the printing press, I think, a Gutenberg press. It was about the time when Henry VIII was marrying his sixth or seventh wife. It was the time when the Europeans were starting to explore the world and colonize it. That's another story. But it's really very recent in, in our history, in European history. So in short... Chaitanya made this incarnation in order to make devotion the highest form of spirituality, relation in a loving mood. And, and what's more, he wanted to make it available for everyone. Why is that? Why do we say that he gave Prema Bhakti to everyone? Well, it's because everyone has relations. A jiva is an entity that is made of a soul in a body, and any soul has a spiritual dimension. Any soul has a relation with other souls. So we are already prepared for this in a way, for this coming. But we did not understand before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that this could be a relation to God himself. So we were already there with our souls, but needing to understand that we could also have a relation to a God who is interested in relation, a God who is a lover, a God who is a lover and beloved at the same time. And this is why we say then that 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu gave us Manjuri Bhav. Manjuri Bhav, is, which is the mood of those who are serving the love of God. So he doesn't want us to be devotees of him directly, not devotees of Radha directly, but devotees of the loving relation of Radha and Mohan. Devotees of love, so to speak. This is our, this is our goal. The Manjari Bhav is the mood of being a devotee of love itself. And at the highest level, the love of Radha and Mohan. So instead of saying that we serve Radha like a new goddess, kind of taking the place switched out from Krishna, no, it's not like this. We are devotees and servants of Radha in her love for her Mohan. We are there to serve her love for Mohan. It's not just a switching of Krishna for Radha like this, a new god. Then we have the same issue. We're there to serve the love that she feels, to increase that love, to increase her desire, and then to increase then the pleasure of Mohan. And this is why Gurudev teaches us that in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance, there are three aspects. Radha, as lover of Mohan. Mohan, as beloved of Radha. And Manjari Bhav, as consciousness of this love and service of this love. So it's this service that is our goal when our goal is to be Manjaris. So there is our origin story in a very brief form, if you like. So we're reading chapter four. We'll continue. I won't spend more time on looking backwards. Uh, the, the internal, the confidential reasons for appearance. This followed chapter three, you remember, which was the external reasons for appearance. And the final note to make in our introduction is that we often speak of the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in two, two stages, even though the work Chaitanya Charitamrita has three parts. We sometimes say that the early life, the Nuava Deep Lila, until he turned around 22 and uh, started to manifest the appearance of a devotee of Krishna in his external form, what Gurudev sometimes calls two souls in one body. And then the latter part of his life, when he's starting to have realizations about the Brajvila, uh, Lila, the, about the loving relations between Radha and Mohan. He's visualizing these, he's talking about these, he's feeling this as though he's living it himself towards the end of his life. So this is an internal consciousness that's developing. And this is what the Gurudev sometimes calls two bodies in one soul. So the Na Navadvipa Lila, two souls in one body. So Krishna and a devotee of Krishna in one body. And in the Raj Lila, towards the end of his life, two bodies in one soul, Radha and Mohan. Last time we finished verse 31 and then read two more verses. Verse 31, we talked about again Parakya Bhav and how loving relation towards Krishna makes us forget our material consciousness. And the story that we talked about as the uh, example of this is the 
Gopi Lila, the uh, Rasa Lila, where the, all the Gopis who are married and have children and families and homes, they find that their inner feelings for Krishna, their soul feelings, their spiritual feelings are so strong that they forget their material consciousness. They leave their material consciousness for spiritual consciousness. In other words, the beauty of the internal life of Krishna is enough to inspire all of us to turn to our spiritual feelings, our deep, authentic feelings for the divine. These deep spiritual feelings are not romantic love, that's material, not Hollywood love, like I call it, but rather pure, selfless attachment to the divine. Uh, a second point to remember was that Prabhupada commented very nicely that um, devotional service begins when we give up our designations. It was this word designations that we discussed a bit last week. A designation is a role that we're given externally that were given from outside us, from by someone else, without any regard for our soul, for our soul identity, for our svaru. And Prabhupada had commented that we begin our devotional life when we give up the identities that others give us. And we go deeper in the identity that lies in our own soul. So that was a very interesting and, and beautiful way of talking about the evolution towards our svarup. And the third and last point on uh, verse 31 was about viraha, uh, love in separation. And we underlined, that was a long commentary by Prabhupada, and we underlined how longing itself is the center of bhakti that it's not unity with God that we experience, but it's the desire to be close to God which makes our feelings grow. And therefore, that is central to bhakti. And to accept this idea, it's important to understand that the suffering caused by separation is not the material kind. It's not that I get lonely at night, I need more hugs, I need someone to have dinner with. It's not this kind of suffering. It's a spiritual suffering, which is entirely, it sounds strange, but entirely pleasurable, entirely relishable. It's a pure longing which is not associated with pain. Chapter 32 was about the appearance of Chaitanya, and I just want to remind you of what we said about it last week. We said one important thing, which was that, and I'll even read the verse for you, I shall taste the essence of all these rasas, and in this way I shall favor all the devotees. The rasas that he's talking about, you remember, are the rasas that he feels in the pastimes with Radha. Well, in all the Vraj pastimes. And the different kinds of flavors that he feels, these will benefit the devotees. And I think if I remember right, we'll come back to that today. Then finally, verse 33 was talking about the Mana Shiksha, which is a small text by Raghunathas Goswami that um, Prabhupada cites in his commentary. Because the verse 33 
said that we should abandon dharma. We should abandon dharma. And dharma is understood as culturally or socially based spirituality. The spiritually the spirituality that we seek is based on the svarup, on the soul, not on external uh, practices, not on external rules and regulations, which make up the social religion, which is called dharma. In spiritual consciousness, there is higher meaning than in the spirituality of dharma. Said the verse, and then Prabhupada took that up again. And then the last, the very last thing from verse 33 was about anurag shakti, which is our internal energy. And there was a very nice commentary by Prabhupada about how we should learn to watch this internal shakti, this internal potency or energy, which flows from Radha, which is embodied by Radha and flows through her, how it flows also through us. So one way of understanding spiritual evolution is learning how to observe Radha's energy flowing through our own hearts. This was Prabhupada's commentary on, on, uh, on the verse. Now we continue with verse 34. Anugraha bhaktanam manusham deham ashritaha bhajate ta tarishi krida ya shrutva tat parubhavat. It's actually a verse from in Sanskrit from Srimad Bhagavatam, which Prabhupada says later on in his commentary. And this is how Prabhupada. Translates it. Krishna manifests his eternal human like form and performs his pastimes to show mercy to the devotees. Having heard such pastimes, one should engage in service to him. So Krishna manifests his eternal human-like form. He appears in a human form through the pastimes. It says, what does it say? Manusam deham ashritaha. He takes a body, assumes a body. And he performs his pastimes. Very nice. But why does he perform his pastimes? Well, the verse tells us for the mercy, to show mercy to his devotees. To show mercy to his devotees. So my first curiosity when I read this verse is to say, well, how does Krishna in his pastimes show mercy to his devotees? That's my question when I start reading this. So let's, let's see what Prabhupada can help us to understand. First, it's important to note that even though we're focused on internal reasons, confidential reasons for the appearance in this chapter 4, here is a very generous and sweet external reason. It's for his devotees that he appears. It's the kind of reason we might have expected to read in chapter 3 about the external reasons. So here he's considering about his devotees. Or maybe if we want to think very deeply, we could say, well, wait a minute, Udar. When he's thinking about his devotees, he's actually thinking about internal reasons because his devotees are in his heart. Or because perhaps his soul, the devotee soul is part and parcel of his soul. Maybe we could 
understand this way. In any case, he's thinking about his devotees. And he, he's carrying out his pastimes in order to be merciful to them, to give mercy to them. Remember what mercy is? Or maybe better we should say, remember what mercy is not. Mercy is not a thing. Mercy is not an object. It's not like a piece of gold or a coin of money. It's not food or water. It's not a house or a car. Mercy is a way of being. Mercy means letting come what will come. Letting flow what needs to flow. And when I say it's not a thing, I don't mean it's unimportant. It's everything. Because we are blocked in every way. We jivas. We sadhakas. So mercy is letting flow what needs to flow. Removing the blockages. So it's not a normal gift. So when we say Krishna gives us the gift of mercy or, or something like this. It's not a gift that's a thing. It's a gift as a way of, of being. And there's nothing we could do to get this mercy, mercy. We can pray for hours if we like. It doesn't matter. Mercy, we remember this slogan, mercy is causeless. There's no cause for it. It just comes and when, when it comes, the energy that needs to flow, flows. The energy that needs to come, comes. So now in this verse we read that, well, Krishna is doing his pastimes to show mercy. How does he show mercy by doing his pastimes? Well, the greatest mercy, I think, and we'll come to Prabhupada here very soon, the greatest mercy, I think, is that he helps his devotees to understand what prema is. By allowing us to observe the pastimes of Radha and Mohan in the forests of Vrindavan, we come to an understanding of what the meaning of our lives is, namely prema. The goal of our life in, as bhaktas is to increase prema to realize Prem. And by doing his pastimes, Radha Mohan lets us understand that, or lets us observe that, lets us have some kind of realization of that. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes two souls in one body, Radha and Mohan, two souls in relation to each other so that we, the sadhakas, on the path to becoming manjaris, can observe the, what goes on between these two souls. And what goes on between these two souls is love. Prem. He came as two souls so that we could say, see what kind of loving energy flows from God to God from Radha to Mohan, from Mohan to Radha. So that is the mercy, the mercy of letting this understanding come to us, letting us discover this understanding, and by discovering this understanding, naturally letting us uh, discover it in ourselves. Because how can we understand Prem, divine love, love of God? only by feeling it ourselves, only by finding that little trace of it in our own hearts and then growing that trace to make it bigger. You cannot explain Prem. You cannot go to the bookshop and get the book about Prem. You can only discover it through association. And the greatest association that we could have is of Radha, and Mohan in their loving relation, exchanging Prem. That is the way that we can understand it. 
That is the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Once again, it's mercy because it's letting come what must come. And what is it that must come? Our understanding of Prim. Letting flow in us the deepening understanding of Prim by observing ever close, more closely, the exchange of love between Radha and Mohan. Letting us observe ever more closely, and who observes the very most closely? The Manjaris, of course. So the highest level of realizing Prem, without being Radha and Mohan, is in Manjari Bhav. And that's the highest level of evolution for our souls and the goal for our practice, Manjari Bhav. So if we wanted to talk about Mahaprabhu's message, it's kind of foolish to talk about a message because he doesn't have a book. He doesn't have words. Even the eight verses of Shikshastakam were probably um, dictated to Swarup Damodar. It's a little unsure with the historians, but so there's no books. There's nothing, um, nothing to buy at the bookshop that comes directly from the pen of Mahaprabhu, or at least not very much. His mercy to us is from his heart, that he opens his heart. He opens his heart by dividing himself in two. What greater opening of the heart can there be? He shows the inside of the heart, of his heart, by showing what it is like for love to flow from him as a lover to him as a beloved, or rather to see what to show love that flows from her as a lover to him as a bit of them. And this is what it means to share the confidential reasons. We could almost say, couldn't we, that Tatanya Mahaprabhu, his message is one word. And that word is Look. I wanted to say in French, voila, which is what you say when there's nothing to say, there's just look here. Look at what love looks like. My life is what love looks like. Prem. My life, my appearance, my pastimes, this is what you need to realize. So my message to you is look. And look says everything. It says, look clearly, look with your spiritual eyes, look with your heart, don't think, don't do, just look. Gurudev would say, of course, be the viewer, not the doer. Be the viewer, just look. So Mahaprabhu's message, it's not even one book, it's one word, look. Um, let's see. Uh, that covers the first half of the verse. I repeat, Krishna manifests his eternal human-like form and performs his pastimes to show mercy to the devotees. But now there's a second part of the verse. Let's discuss that a moment. The second part of the verse is this, in translation. Having heard such pastimes, one should engage in service to him.
So we could say it's a different, it's another way, an additional way of understanding the meaning of appearance for appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yes, we should uh, accept the mercy which is caused by, which is generated by the, the pastimes. But having then heard about the pastimes, we should engage in service. And this is a very special verse in, in, in Sanskrit, which is a little bit beyond my Sanskrit competence, but we'll try. We'll come back to it in the next verse. But essentially it's saying, if you hear these pastimes, it will give you the desire to, devote, to, to be a devotee. It will give you the desire to serve. Yes, Chaitanya comes to teach. Yes, Chaitanya comes to show through his pastimes. But he also comes in order to create devotion, to inspire devotion, to fill his devotees with love, and to let the love that's already living in his devotees flow. And this is why we listen to these divine pastimes and when we read Vilapakus Manjari and Radha Rasa Sudhaniti and other, other beautiful works. We don't listen to them so much for the facts and figures of the pastimes, but in order to feel the um, charm, the tenderness of the pastimes, so that we can release the feelings that we have in our hearts through the pastimes. So we hear these tender stories and it makes our hearts beat and it makes our feelings flow. This is the second half of the verse which says that he shows us the pastimes in order to make devotees for out of us, to increase our devotion. Because when, he de when we increase our devotion, then uh, we increase our our, our, our support, our love for Radha, who increases her love for Mohan, and Mohan is happy. So the pastimes are also a kind of door opener for our feelings, which is again what we said mercy is. It's something that makes things flow, makes feelings flow. Now let's go to Prabhupada's commentary and see what he says. First, he says this text, the, the verse, is from Srimad Bhagavatam. That's like I said before. And he goes on, Prabhupada, the Supreme Personality of Godhead has innumerable expansions of his transcendental form, who eternally exists in the spiritual world. So endless forms, and they've always been there, they'll always be in the spiritual world. He goes on, this material world is only a perverted reflection of the spiritual world. Where, meaning in the spiritual world, everything is manifested without inebriety, this is a very strange word that I had to look in the dictionary myself. Inebriety means uh, drunk, drunkenness. So the material world is a perverted reflection of the spiritual world. It's an impure version of the spiritual world. And in the spiritual world, everything is without drunkenness, without confusion, without unclearness, without inebriety. Inebriety is a state of the material world where we are drunk on material distractions, drunk on material pleasures and sensations, where we live in our material ears and our material eyes and our material senses. Mm. Couldn't it be the other way around, um, 
that this material world isn't manifested without drunkenness, without this, this pleasure, without this love, without being intoxicated by this uh, prema. In German, it sounds like this, that the material world is manifested without drunkenness, only rational. It's manifested in the spiritual world without drunkenness. Can you read in German? Uh, yes. Unsere materielle Welt ist nur eine verzerrte Spiegelung der spirituellen Welt. Ah ja, okay. In Recording in progress. Typical. It blocked just. It blocked just at the moment you said. Oops. Are you still blocked? Yes. Rade? Rade, are we back? Sorry, I, I lost just when you were speaking the, the verse, uh, Sudevi, I, I, it blocked. Now I put it on my hotspot, so we try. Uh, can you try that again? In the spiritual world, you were saying, yes. then, then what? <laughs> yeah, I think in the correct. Um, unsere materielle Welt ist nur eine verzerrte Spiegelung der spirituellen Welt, in der alles ohne Trunkenheit manifestiert. And, but I thought this, this, this drunkenness is, is a drunkenness of, of prema, of intoxicated yeah. by this love. But I think it's... An, no, I like that. I like it very much. No, I like your reading very much. Yes. And you can't tell because both the spiritual world and the material world are feminine and so you don't... Yeah, maybe. I like. So then he goes on to... Prabhupada goes on to describe that... to say that in the spiritual world... Uh, world Please let me know if there comes a problem with sound or something because it's a little bit dodgy. He says, there, meaning in the spiritual world, everything is in its original existence, free from the domination of time. You could almost say it's constitutional position, free from the domination of time. So in the spiritual world, there's no time that passes, nothing rots away like in the material world. No bodies disappear, no... Our houses don't fall down, our, our cars don't rust away and all, all the rest. So the spiritual world is um, timeless. In fact, time is material, right? Time is a, one of the forms of maya, of, of illusion, that keeps us covered. If we actually knew that our souls would last forever, we would probably behave differently in our material lives. If we actually realize that time is material, that time belongs only to the things that we surround ourselves with and that our soul would live forever, then we might behave differently. But this is another question for another day. Um, yeah. Prabhupada goes on now and says, Time... Time cannot deteriorate or interfere with the conditions in the spiritual world where different manifestations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead are the recipients 
of the worship of different living entities in their constitutional spiritual positions. Whoa, there's a lot going on here. So in the spiritual world, there are different manifestations of the divine, of God. And these receive devotion from different from different uh, souls who have arrived in their svarup. Yes. Jai Gurudev, did you want to did you want to help us? Beautiful, wow. wonderful, and uh, our so Devi also has a nice cushion. Yes, very conscious, and I'm very happy. Our cushions are very big. Indeed, many things will be very clear, like. You have a special quality to explain everyone. Mm -hmm. This is your gift. Mm -hmm. Gift by Krishna. It's very good to have the mercy of devotees, as we know. <laughs> and the question answers also. You beautifully give, they can understand very well. I'm very pleased. How many times are you joining? Um, 26. Um, now comes a really very special comment from Srila Prabhupada that, really, that I think that can help us greatly to understand the purpose of our strange material lives. He says, now I'm quoting him, in, he says, in the spiritual world, all existence is unadulterated goodness means pure, uncontaminated goodness. Now I lost my power. Up. I'm going to back. Um, this is generator gift. <laughs> I'm waiting for the generator now, but it's okay. The, I have my battery on the computer. Oh, there we go. There it came. Thank you, Generator Plem. We're back. Thank you, Gaura Sundara. <laughs> he was very quick to come to Rindava and Gaura then. It only took him uh, 10 seconds to arrive and he fixed everything. <laughs> so, and uh, Prabhupada then says, well, the spiritual world is pure goodness, pure goodness. And then he says, the goodness found in the material world is contaminated by the modes of passion and ignorance, by the gunas you remember from Bhagavad Gita. I, I like this very much. It says to wow. us, that material world is fundamentally good, but it's covered by material coverings. And that when, when we learn to realize and clear away the blockages to our own realization, then the material world itself will appear fundamentally good, fundamentally spiritual. And then it's only because of the gunas, the rajas and the tamas gunas, that this goodness is brought. I feel this deeply in my heart. And it's not too many, you don't read it very often, but I feel this very deeply. That 
the, that the constitutional position of all souls and all the material world too is fundamentally good and that we are simply standing in the way through our different attachments and blockages, we're standing in the way of this goodness. Now, Prabhupada again, the saying that the human form of life is the best position for devotional service has its special significance because only in this form can a living entity revive his eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Also a magnificent comment. I repeat, the saying that the human form of life is the best position for devotional service has its special significance, special meaning, because only in this form can a living entity revive his eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It's only because we live in this form as jivas, as soul beings in material bodies, that we are able to return to our constitutional position, uh, Prabhupada says, revive our eternal relationship. We can return to our constitutional position by returning to our svarup and re-establish our relationship with the Supreme Personality of God. <laughs> So in other words, the relation, the, the pure, complete relation to the divine is already already there in our constitutional position, in our svarup, waiting for us to clear away the rubbish, clear away the coverings through our devotional service. It's covered, but it needs to be revised, re, re, uh, sorry, revived, brought back to life. And it's this process then of bringing back to life of our, of our svarup, which is sleeping under all the covering. It's this process that liberates our love for the divine. That's the mercy. Mercy means getting out of the way, letting flow what needs to flow. And through our, the gift of our devotion, we are able to open the door to our svarup, and from there flows the prem, the love of the divine, which is so, so desired by Radha and so desired by her Mohan. That love of the divine returns through our devotion to Krishna through Radha. And this is why, obviously, Krishna is very happy when the devotee becomes devotee. Because then this, the prem starts to flow again. And his enjoyment increases because Radha's reservoir of ras increases. She loves more, he enjoys more, the devotees have more mercy, and so on and so forth. When Krishna is pleased, the Mercy flows. When the mercy flows, Krishna is more pleased. Releasing love in all its forms, in all its levels, pleases the divine, pleases the divine couple. The slightest bit of love for a flower you pick in your garden releases a tiny atom of love which flows through Radha flows to Mohan and pleases 
the divine. The more we let our feelings flow, this is, the Guru Dev teaches this every single day. Let our feelings flow. Do what you need to do to make the feelings flow. Open the doors to your heart. He says it in 10 different ways every day. Feelings come first. Feelings give meaning. Feelings give more love. Feelings give wisdom. Do everything you can in your life to let feelings flow. That's another name for devotion, making feelings flow. And it's the path, I think that's what Prabhupada is trying to say here. It's also the path to deepening, deepening our understanding of our svarup. The more our devotion lets feelings flow, the more the divine couple is pleased, yes, but also the more we go deep into our own svarup and discover our own constitutional position. So everyone is happy. I know it sounds a little bit... Uh, utopian but when feelings flow Radha Mohan is happy and we become more we come closer to our svarup. we come closer to what is real we come closer to to who we are what we are to our constitutional position what's splendid about this idea is it, it doesn't matter what form this love takes. Very best is to dedicate direct and perfect love to Radha Mohan. Yes, that's very best. But any whiff, any tiny gesture of love is doing the same work. Maybe at smaller scale, smaller level. But any bit of love that's given is given ultimately to Radha Mohan. This is why feelings in all their forms are welcome. Feelings in all their forms are desired. Now, and Prabhupada is really strong about saying that the human form is the best uh, platform from which to do this. He says now, I quote, the human form is considered the highest state in the cycle of the species of life in the material world. So you might think that human life is very difficult, maybe a little boring, maybe a little bit too hard work, but it's the top class in the spiritual ladder of affairs. Human life is the top class before spiritual world. It's higher than demigods, it's higher than demons, it's higher than animals, it's higher than plants, it's higher than uh, inanimate things. So to uh, attain to the level where you are as humans, you may have gone through thousands or millions of rebirths and now you've come to this position where you have such an opportunity to fully realize your soul and to fully surrender that soul to love of the divine that now is the now is a very hopeful very optimistic time and Prabhupada now says something like this too he says if one takes advantage of this highest kind of material form, that is our form, the human form, one can regain his position of devotional service to the Lord. So I think he means pure devotional service. If we really take advantage of the fact that we have these lovely bodies which can permit us to do good work, to go to temple, to do seva, to care for others, to express love in all forms, in all parts of our lives. If we take advantage of that, says Prabhupada, then we have a chance to 
uh, obtain, attain our constitutional position. If we make use of all our resources, then we can find our way to realizing our soul and to um, enter our svarup. Prabhupada now. Incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead appear in all the species of life, although this is inconceivable to the human brain. So Radha Mohan is also in the silly monkeys, also in the flowers, also in the, in the demigods, also in the mice that are running around my room. They're in all of these material forms. We can only see, or we can see best in the eyes of other humans. Sometimes we don't see so well, but we can see best in the eyes of other humans. But we're less aware of those in other material forms. And now Prabhupada goes on. The Lord's pastimes are differentiated according to the appreciating capacity of the different types of bodies of the living entities. So th we understand and realize the pastimes to the degree that we have the spiritual advancement to do that. Different levels of entities realize the pastimes in different levels. The flowers the least, the mice more, the monkeys more, the cows even better, etc., etc. So that's very cute to think, but the important point is that we see and understand and realize the divine pastimes to the degree that our soul is evolved. Which means, the more we focus on evolving our souls, realizing our swarup, realizing our, our spiritual identity, the more the pastimes will be meaningful for, for us. So, for example, we, when we read the pastimes in Virapakus Manjari with Gurudev, you can notice quickly that Gurudev sees in them 100 different things when you and I struggle to see one or two different things. So the degree of spiritual evolution determines the degree of enjoyment that comes from observing the pastimes. A highly evolved soul sees Krishna absolutely everywhere. A less evolved soul sees Krishna or Radha Mohan in some things and so on and so forth. It's kind of like a spiritual, um, what do you call that? a spiritual speedometer. The more you see Radha Mohan in your spiritual, in your everyday life, the more you are deeping, diving deep in, into your svarup. And when you begin to see Radha Mohan in everything, then you have entered your Siddha Deha. This is what Siddhadeya means. Siddhadeya doesn't mean, oops, Siddhadeya doesn't mean someone who's taken off on a spaceship to a different planet. Siddhadeya means literally the perfected body. So it's the body that is so spiritual that it only sees spiritual, it only hears spiritual, only feels spiritual.
Prabhupada continues. The Supreme Lord bestows, means gives, bestows the most merciful benediction upon human society when he appears in his human form. It is then that humanity gets the opportunity to engage in different kinds of eternal service to the Lord. Very sweet. It's the great gift. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving us an enormous gift because he gives us the chance to do service. When Krishna is pleased, uh, mercy reigns on the devotees. And that mercy takes the form of being able to open our hearts and devote more of our hearts to the divine. And since human beings, Prabhupada said a moment ago, since human beings are particularly good, particularly adapted, particularly clever at doing devotional service, the fact that he appears as a human among us gives us an extra possibility to advance in spiritual life, to advance in devotion, to, to give, to do service at the highest level. So all service is good, all devotional service is good when it comes from your heart. Cleaning your house in the, in the, for the pleasure of Radha Mohan is good. Taking care of your friends is good. Taking care of your family is better. But taking care of Radha Mohan is the best. Um, now Prabhupada says, special natural appreciation of the descriptions of a particular pastime of Godhead insti- in indicates the constitutional position of a living entity. This is very sweet. It means that if you have a particular taste for one of the pastimes, maybe you like, for example, you have a taste for the pastime of the Manjari singing in the ear of of Radha. This is a reflection of your Svarup. Your Svarup in Manjari form, it has a particular taste for singing, for serving Radha in that way. And so it's a very wonderful ad- adventure when you read the pastimes, you each and one, every one of you, to develop a sense of your own taste to say to yourself, what is it that, that I feel? How does that touch me? And when you focus on that sp- specific flavor that you get from reading or listening to pastime, then that can help you to better understand your own sarup, to understand what kind of manjari you actually are, what kind of service you prefer, what kind of personality you have. So there's a very sweet pleasure to have by taking a completely personal relationship to the, to the pastimes. When we're reading Vilapakus Manjari, for example, be sensitive to the taste that you have for each of these, and it will tell you and help you to come closer to yourself. Udava, mm. I think this is really important, what you are saying. That means to appreciate myself in my uniqueness and don't look what others are doing, to trust myself. Mm. Love it. Thank you very much. You said it better than I did. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So there is no competition. No, there's no competition. No, and and what's that vergleich? No, comparison. Comparison, yes. Mm. Yeah. Competition perhaps. <laughs> very, very sweetly said, yes. Association is important for us. 
But spiritual path is a unique and personal one. Every every um, soul is unique. Every soul is unique, and every soul has a unique relationship to the divine. So then Prabhupada goes back to some of the different kinds of relationships we can have to Krishna, and these are relationships you'll remember from from uh, the theory of bhakti. Uh, he says, adoration, servitorship, friendship, excuse me, parental affection, and conjugal love are the five primary relationships with Krishna. Adoration, servitorship, which is not an English word, but if you're wondering, <laughs> friendship, parental affection, and conjugal love. So devotion, service, friendship, parent, and conjugal. These are the five levels in bhakti. We hear about these quite often. The highest perfectional stage of the conjugal relationship, enriched by many sentiments, give the, gives the maximum rela relishable mellow to the devotee. So Madhuriya Ras is the highest. The point is that the deeper your relation to the divine, the greater the flavor it will produce in your everyday life. You can select, you can choose the level of relation you want with the divine. And on the, as a basis of your choice, you will relish. If you want to go deeper, you'll relish more. If maybe you don't have time to go deeper, you relish somewhat less. But there's a very clear relationship between the devotion you give and the relish you will, you will enjoy. The highest level is, is devotion to Radha Mohan, as in Manjaripav. The Lord appears the Lord appears in different incarnations, says Prabhupada, as a fish, tortoise, and boar, as a Parashurama, Lord Rama, as Buddha, and so on. So the Lord is in many forms. To reciprocate the different appreciations of living entities in different stages of evolution. It's very sweet. Krishna appears throughout time in different incarnations, as a fish, as a tortoise, and so on, so that he can have a relationship of devotion on the level of the devotee. It's very merciful. So once again, it's, it's the absolutely opposite of the opulent, scary, all-powerful God who appears as the great commander and doesn't care about who you are, but demands veneration, demands respect. In contrast to that, here we have Krishna who is, if you're a fish, no problem. He'll take the body of a fish in order to have a relationship with you. If you're a pig, you'll take the relationship of a pig to have a, a, a relationship with you. Sorry, you'll take the body of a pig to have a relationship with you. If you're a Buddha, he'll, he'll be a Buddha. Whatever is needed in order to have a devotional relationship with you. Uh, Prabhupada goes on and says, the conjugal relationship of amorous love is called Parakya, 
uh, Ras. We talked a lot about this. And it is unparalleled perfection of love exhibited by Lord Krishna and his devotees. Now we'll finish with a very strong criticism by Prabhupada of a sect of devotees called the Sahajyas. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada describes them this way. A class of so-called devotees known as Sahajyas, which is also known as a kind of well, we'll get into the details, but the spontaneous, it's a practice of bhakti, or it, at least it thinks it is. A so-called devotees, Prabhupada says, they try to imitate the Lord's pastimes. Although they have no understanding of the amorous love in his expansions of pleasure potency. So this is a group, it's well known, um, it started out in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, but then broke off. And it believes, if I'm not wrong, it believes that men and women are then themselves a microcosm of the Vrindavan forest. And that the original divine pastimes should be repeated between men and women so that they have practices where they carry out the sexual pastimes of the Vrajlila in material, in material world. And uh, many people think this is wrong and Prabhupada thinks this is wrong and he's going to explain to us now why. He says, their special imitation can create havoc, means chaos, on the path for the advancement of one's spiritual relationship with the world. Sorry, with the Lord. So he calls what this group does imitation. They're imitating the pastime instead of having a relation to it. He continues, Material sexual indulgence can never be equated with spiritual love, which is in unadulterated goodness, in pure goodness. The activities of the sahajyas simply lower one deeper into the material contamination of the senses and mind. And Prabhupada says so because he believes this is fake, artificial. Um, it's not spiritual love. But I think we can go a step farther and say it's inappropriate because it does not, um, it's not based on relation, on a relation with God. It's trying to be God by enacting the, the leelas ourselves. And I can think of one more reason, actually, why it's unfortunate and inappropriate. It's because, as we said many times, material pleasures are finite, conditioned, conditional. And spiritual love is inexhaustible, infinite. So when trying to imitate the practices of the lilas with finite material practices, we can only hurt them. We can only weaken. We can only be left with bitterness and suffering. Now Prabhupada will continue, complete this criticism and then we'll complete the the commentary of this verse. Prabhupada says, Krishna's transcendental pastimes display eternal servitorship. So in the eternal seva or devotional service, 
to Adhokshaja, Vishnu, which is Vishnu, the Supreme Lord, who is beyond all conception through material senses. In other words, this group of imitators cannot even conceive of what these pastimes are, let alone imitate them in material settings. Materialistic conditioned souls do not understand the transcendental exchanges of love, but they like to indulge in sense gratification in the name of devotional service. So because they are limited, we don't need to experience the same, same thing that Krishna experiences, the same thing that Radha and Mohan experiences. We want to have a relation to it. We don't want to be gods. We want to love God. And like I was saying, because these material experiences are limited, they're always limited in material life, they end when the material, the sexual union ends, and then they're followed by suffering, by longing, by bitterness, by emptiness. And this is something that would never happen in the spir spiritual world, in the lilas of the spiritual world. And that's why these material imitations are not imitations at all. They're imitations of a false idea of what an imitation would look like. Now, Prabhupada, again, the activities of the Supreme Lord can never be understood by irresponsible persons who think the pastimes of Radha and Krishna to be ordinary affairs. The rasa dance is arranged by Krishna's internal potency, Yogamaya, and it is beyond the grasp of the materially affected person. So these imitators are very foolish to think they're imitating an experience of God. They're very foolish and they're very arrogant. Prabhupada says, trying to throw mud <laughs> into transcendence with their perversity, the sah sahajiyas misinterpret the sayings tat Paratvena, Nirmalam, and Tat Parobhave. Uh, tat Paratvena ni, ni, Nirmalam ni, means pure virtue by through transcendence, and Tat Parobhave means through devotion. So just the fact that they think they're imitating God is a disaster before it even starts. Prabhupada now is about to conclude by misinterpreting Tadrishi, Tadrisha Kadkrida, past, these pastimes, they want to indulge in sex while pretending to imitate Lord Krishna. But one must actually understand the imports, the meanings of the words through the intelligence of the authorized Goswamis. In other words, they cannot begin to understand what these pastimes mean. And I would say, even if they study with the Goswamis, they will not understand perfectly. Srila Narutama Das Thakur says in his prayers to the Goswamis, he has explained his inability to understand such spiritual affairs. So even the great Goswami, Narottama Das Thakur, says that he can't understand the spiritual affairs. He says, Rupa Raghunata Padeha Ibe Akuti Kabe Hame Bujhaba Se Yugala Piriti, which he translates, Prabhupada translates, when I shall be eager to understand the literature given by the Goswamis, then I shall be able to understand the transcendental love affairs of Radha and Krishna. 
So it's not by imitating their sexual activities in the material way that we will understand the pastimes of God. It's by understanding through devotion these pastimes. And finally, Prabhupada says, in other words, unless one, <coughs> unless one is trained under the disciplic succession of the Goswamis, one cannot understand Radha and teach them. The conditioned souls are naturally averse to understanding the spiritual existence of the Lord. Averse means they are unable or un unwilling to understand the spiritual existence of the Lord. And if they try to know the transcendental nature of the Lord's pastimes, while they remain absorbed in materialism, they are sure to blunder like the Sahajyas. In other words, Prabhupada ends the commentary on this verse, 34, by saying the criticism of the Sahajyas, these imitators, should also apply to all of us. If somehow we think we can understand the pastimes of the divine by imitating, then we are lost. We cannot understand in our material consciousness the transcendental pastimes of the of Radhamon. This is elementary. And if we do try to do that, we will blunder like the Sahajyas. We can only understand the transcendental pastimes by becoming transcendental ourselves. And that means by entering deeply into our own Swarup, entering deeply into our own souls, entering in a profound devotional relationship with Radha Mohan through our practice, through our practice of bhakti. <laughs>